Hello dear students, welcome to today's lecture. Today I am going to discuss about an important food plant that is potato. In this lecture I will deliberate upon botany, cultivation and economic importance of potato. Dear students, I will begin with the origin of potato plant. Potato is one of the leading food plants. Botanical name of potato is Solanum tuberosum. It belongs to the family Solanaceae. The basic haploid chromosome number is 12. The genus Solanum, which includes the potato, comprises about 2000 species. Nearly 200 of these are tuber bearing. The plants belonging to the genus are mostly herbs and shrubs. A few are small trees and some are even climbers. The original home of potatoes is in South America where several distinct tuber bearing species of Solanum are found. Many of these species are even cultivated by the local people. Although in South America, potatoes are grown in the cooler temperate regions of the Andean mountains, a number of these are also found in the coastal plains of Chile in the south. The Lake Titicaca Basin in Peru Bolivian region seems to be the main center of origin of cultivated potatoes. Here we can find the largest diversity of genetic materials. Secondary focus of origin lies in Chile which includes the island of Chilo. It was first revealed by Russian scientists that the great diversity of forms exist in these primary and secondary centers of origin. They were of view that among the tetraploid cultivated types, the Andean potatoes belong to the species Solanum indigenum and the Chilean types belong to Solanum tuberosum. But later it was found that there does not exist sufficient justification to regard Solanum indigenum as a separate species from Solanum tuberosum. Hawkes suggested that the two species should be regarded as geographical subspecies of Solanum tuberosum. He designated the Andean short day forms as Solanum tuberosum subspecies indigene and the Chilean long day forms as Solanum tuberosum subspecies chilenum. The common cultivated potato is an assemblage of varieties and types belonging to the species Solanum tuberosum. Now we will know about the various botanical aspects of potato plant. First of all, the growth conditions. The potato is a temperate plant and thrives best in cool regions where sufficient moisture and nourishment are available. Advances in the spheres of breeding have yielded a range of varieties well adapted to near tropical conditions and environment under which the plants often flower. However, in short day and warmer temperatures, the flowering is meager or even completely suppressed and vegetative growth is also considerably depressed. Further, short day conditions induce earliness and usually good tuberization. Therefore, under short day conditions, successful crops of tubers can be raised within a short period. Second is habit. The plants are perpetuated through tubers, but propagation through seed derived from berries is also possible. When propagated from seed, the plants are however not true to the type. Under normal conditions of growth, the plants are herbaceous, succulent, bushy and about 1 to 4 feet in height. Under fertile conditions, the plant produces heavy foliage mass. After discussing the growth conditions and habit, now we will know about the features of various parts of potato plant. First of all, roots. The root of the potato is adventitious and arises from the base of a sprout. Each sprout gives rise to an independent shoot. The root growth is usually restricted to top layers, therefore the plant thrives best on soils where adequate nourishment is available in the top layers of soil. In rich soils, the lateral roots may spread to nearly 3 feet. Some varieties possess a fibrous tuber root system and are hardier than those which produce only a superficial and restricted root growth. Second is stem. The upper part of the sprout develops into the stem. 
The stem is of a branching type and the branches arise laterally. The stems may be erect and hard, firm and spreading or weak and flexible. The aerial stem may be solid or hollow. The terminal portion is always solid, the stem is more or less triangular. The peculiar feature of the potato is presence of the underground stem known as the stolon. At the ends of stolons are born the tubers which again are modified stems. The stolons arise laterally as axillary buds on the underground portion of the stem. Third is leaf. The leaf of the potato is compound. It's pinnate with several pairs of leaflets arising in succession along the rachis. The leaflets are more or less opposite and there is a large terminal or leaflet. Between successive pairs of lateral leaflets on the rachis, folioles are present, which usually arise in pairs. They are invariably present, but their number and size vary with varieties. At the junction where the base of the rachis meet a stem, a pair of small leaf-like structures called the stipules is present. They are usually curved, half leaf blade like structures. The leaves arise along the stem in a spiral arrangement. They are arranged in three ranked manner that is, the fourth leaf stands vertically over the first leaf, the fifth leaf over the second, the sixth over the third, and seventh over the fourth, and so on. Now, the tuber. The tuber varies considerably in size and shape. It may be round to long and finger shape. It may be regular or highly irregular. Whatever the shape and size of the tuber, its rows and heel can always be distinguished. The rose or the apical end lies in its natural position in the ground towards the outside. The heel is the attachment end of the tuber to the stolon. Eyes are present on the surface of the tuber and bear buds. There are usually several buds on each eye. The eyes are invariably more numerous towards the apical part of the tuber than towards the heel portion. Normally, it is the apical eye that sprouts first. This dominance of apical sprout suppresses sprouting in the lateral eyes. However, if the tubers are cut or apical sprout is removed or otherwise damaged, this apical dominance is lost and every eye of the tuber sprouts equally well. Now, the inflorescence. The flowers of the potato are usually born on a long inflorescence which is simple and rarely compound. The flower is gamopetalous, bisexual and complete. The calyx consists of five sepals united for about half their length. The free ends of sepals vary in shape from narrowly lanceolate to broadly oval. Sepals are persistent and remain attached to the berry. Corolla consists of five petals united for more than half their length. Each petal has two wings whose sides are attached to the wing of the adjacent petal and the point of union is usually marked off by a notch. The main petal with a hairy cover on the underside is thicker than the wings which are thin lateral extensions of the main petal body. The greater the development of the wings, the more pronounced the fold in the petals. Androsium consists of five epipetalous anthers closely surrounding the style in the form of a cone. The size and shape of the cone vary with varieties. Each anther has a distinct filament, anther lobes and a connective. The filament is short. The anthers are somewhat broad at the base and have two distinct pollen chambers. The anthers are usually yellow to orange in color and the tips are often marked off by a light color that indicates the position of terminal pores. Gynaecium consists of a distinct ovary, a style and a stigma. The ovary is bicarpillary, bilocular, syncarpus and superior. The ovary may or may not be distinctly marked off from the style. The style is variable in length, usually long and appearing well above the anther cone. Lastly, fruit. On fertilization, the ovary develops into berry. Mostly, it's round and fairly large in size. Numerous seeds are arranged in the two chambers of the berry 
along the periphery of placenta. On maturity, the seeds occur a dull brown color. The seeds are about 1.5 mm in length. They are thin, flattened, oval, tapering towards radical end with a little heel indicating the attachment point. They have short dormancy and germinate readily under proper conditions. Dear students, now we will discuss the different parameters related to the cultivation of potato. Potato can be grown under temperate, subtropical and tropical conditions. It is essentially a cool weather crop with temperature being the main limiting factor in production. Tuber growth is sharply inhibited by temperatures below 10 degrees Celsius and above 30 degrees Celsius. Optimum yields are obtained where mean daily temperatures are in the 18 to 20 degrees Celsius range. The potato is a very accommodating and adaptable plant and grows well without ideal soil and growing conditions. However, it is vulnerable to number of pests and diseases. To prevent the build up of pathogens in the soil, farmers avoid growing potato on the same land from year to year. Instead, they grow potato in rotations of three or more years alternating with other dissimilar crops such as maize, beans and alfalfa. Alpha. The first step in the cultivation of potato is the preparation of land. The potato can be grown on any type of soil except saline and alkaline soils. Naturally, loose soils which offer least resistance to enlargement of the tubers are preferred. Loamy and sandy loam soils that are rich in organic matter with good drainage and aeration are the most suitable. For growing potatoes, the soil needs to be harrowed until completely free of weed roots. In most cases, three ploughings along with frequent harrowing and rolling are needed before the soil reaches a suitable condition, that is, it becomes soft, well drained and well aerated. After the preparation of land, planting is done. The potato crop is usually grown not from seed but from seed potatoes which are small tubers or pieces of tubers and sown to a depth of 5 to 10 cm. Tuber seed should be disease free, well sprouted and from 30 to 40 gram each in weight. The planting density of a row of potatoes depends on the size of tubers. Usually about 2 tons of seed potatoes are sown per hectare. Seed potatoes can be planted whole or cut into pieces but each piece should contain at least one eye. In cold climates, potatoes are planted in mid to late spring while as in warm climates, best planting can be done in either late summer or late winter. Different methods of planting the seed potatoes include trench method, scatter method and container method. First of all, the trench method. It is a traditional method of potato planting and involves digging a shallow trench about 6 inch deep and placing the seed potatoes in it with eyes facing up. Then potatoes are covered with a couple of inches of soil. As the potato plant grows, soil is continually held up along the sides of the plants so as to keep the soil around the developing tubers loose. Second method is scatter method. In this, the seed potatoes are simply laid on the soil and then covered with a few inches of mulch. And the third one is container method. In this, seed potatoes are planted in the bottom of a tall container. About 6 inches of soil is put in the bottom first and then seed potatoes are spreaded. The container method makes hilling easy and takes up less space. After planting, Proper care should be taken during the development period. Weeds must be controlled in order to give the crop a competitive advantage. If the weeds are large, they must be removed before ridging operations begin. Ridging consists of mounding the soil from between the rows around the main stem of the potato plant. This keeps the plants upright and the soil loose, prevents insect pests such as tuber moth from reaching the tubers and helps preventing the growth of weeds. After earthing up, weeds between the growing plants and at the top of the ridge 
are removed mechanically or by using herbicides. After crop care, manuring and fertilization should be done. The use of chemical fertilizer depends on the level of available soil nutrients. Potato can benefit from application of organic manure at the start of a new rotation. It provides a good nutrient balance and maintains the structure of the soil. Crop fertilization requirement needs to be correctly estimated according to expected yield, the potential of the variety and the intended use of the harvested crop. Next important parameter in cultivation is the maintenance of water supply. Potatoes need frequent irrigation. The first irrigation should be given immediately after sowing and thereafter at one week intervals. After tuber formation, the frequency of irrigation is decreased. Irrigation should be stopped a few days before harvesting. For best yields, a 122 to 150 day crop requires from 500 to 700 mm of water. In general, water deficits in the middle to late part of the growing period tend to reduce yield more than those in the early part. Certain basic precautions should be taken against diseases. Crop rotation using tolerant varieties and healthy certified seed tubers can help avoid great losses. There is no chemical control for bacterial and viral diseases, but they can be controlled by regular monitoring of their aphid vectors. The severity of fungal diseases such as late blight depends mainly on the weather. The persistence of favorable conditions without chemical spraying can quickly spread the diseases. The damage caused by a major pest, the Colorado potato beetle, can be reduced by destroying beetles, eggs and larvae that appear early in the season. Next step in cultivation is harvesting. Yellowing of the potato plants leaves and easy separation of the tubers from their stolons indicate that the crop has reached maturity. If the potatoes are to be stored rather than consumed immediately, they are left in the soil to allow their sickens to thicken. Thick sickens helps in preventing the storage diseases and shrinkage due to water loss. However, leaving tubers for too long in the ground increases their exposure to a fungal incrustation called black scurf. Depending on the scale of production, potatoes are harvested using a spading fork, a pluff or commercial potato harvesters. During harvesting, it's important to avoid bruising or other injury which provides entry points for storage diseases. The newly harvested tubers are living tissue and therefore subject to deterioration. Thus, proper storage is essential both to prevent post-harvest losses of potatoes destined for fresh consumption or processing and to guarantee an adequate supply of seed tubers for the next cropping season. Storage aims at preventing greening, that is the build-up of chlorophyll beneath the peel which is associated with solanine, a potentially toxic alkaloid and losses in whey and quality. The tubers should be kept at a temperature of 6 to 8 degrees Celsius in a dark, well-ventilated environment with high relative humidity of about 85 to 90 percent. After discussing the various parameters related to cultivation, we will know about nutritional value of potato. Potato is a versatile, carbohydrate-rich food. It's highly popular worldwide and prepared and served in a variety of ways. The potato is one of the cheapest sources of starchy food. The raw tuber contains 70 to 80 percent water, 10 to 30 percent carbohydrates, 1 to 3 percent proteins, 2 to 3 percent fibers, and 0.1 percent of fats. In addition, the potato is low in fat. Potatoes are rich in several micronutrients, especially vitamin C. The potato is a moderate source of iron and it is high vitamin C content promotes iron absorption. It's a good source of vitamins B1, B3 and B6 and minerals such as potassium, phosphorus and magnesium and contains folate, pantothenic acid and riboflavin. Potatoes also contain dietary antioxidants which may play a part in preventing diseases related to aging and dietary fiber which benefits health. 
Since the starch in raw potato cannot be digested by humans, they are prepared for consumption by boiling, baking or frying. Each preparation method affects potato consumption in a different way but all reduce fiber and protein content due to leaching into cooking, water and oil, destruction by heat treatment or chemical changes such as oxidation. Boiling causes a significant loss of vitamin C, especially in peeled potatoes. In general, baking causes slightly higher losses of vitamin C than boiling due to the higher oven temperatures, but losses of other vitamins and minerals during the baking are lower. Now, we will discuss about potato varieties. Although the cultivated potato belongs to just one botanical species, that is Solanum tuberosum, the tubers come in thousands of varieties with great differences in size, shape, color, texture, cooking characteristics and taste. The different varieties include Atahualpa. It is bred in Peru and is a high yielding variety good for both baking and frying. Nicola is widely grown Dutch variety and is one of the best variety for boiling and is also good in salads. Russet Burbank The classic American potato and is excellent for baking and french fries. Lepin Pucula It is grown in Finland for centuries in the fields bathed in the light of midnight sun. Yukon Gold It is a Canadian potato with buttery yellow flesh and is suitable for frying, boiling and mashing. Tubera It is grown in West Africa and has white flesh, pink skin and is also a good yielding variety. Next, Kipfler. It hails from Germany and is elongated with cream flesh and is popular in salads. Whitlot. It is a garment French variety and is prized for its deep blue skin and violet flesh. Maris Bard. It is bred in UK and is a white variety with soft waxy texture and good for boiling. Desire. It's red skin with yellow flesh and has a distinctive flavor. Spanta. It's another popular commercial tuber and is good for boiling and roasting. Mondial. It's a Dutch potato with smooth good looks. It boils and mashes well. Now we will discuss about the economic importance of potato. Potatoes are used for a variety of purposes. In fact, Less than 50% of potatoes grown worldwide are consumed fresh. The rest are processed into potato food products and food ingredients fed to cattle, pigs and chickens, processed into starch for industry and reused as seed tubers for growing the next season's potato crop. First of all, we will discuss about the food uses of potato. Potatoes can be used either in fresh, frozen or dehydrated form. Fresh potatoes are baked, boiled or fried and used in a staggering range of recipes like mashed potatoes, potato pancakes, potato dumplings, potato soup and potato salad. Frozen potatoes including most of the French fries called chips in the UK is served in restaurants and fast food chains worldwide. The production process for this is simple. Peeled potatoes are shot through cutting blades, parboiled, air dried, par fried, frozen and packaged. Another processed product, the potato crisp, Carl chips in the US, is the long standing king of snack foods in many developed countries. It's made from thin slices of deep fried or baked potato. These come in a variety of flavors. Dehydrated potato flakes and granules are made by drying a mash of cooked potatoes to a moisture level of 5 to 8 percent. Flakes are used in retail mashed potato products as ingredients in snacks and even as food aid. Another dehydrated product, potato flour, is ground from cooked whole potatoes. It retains a distinct potato taste. Potato flour is used by the food industry to bind meat mixtures and thicken gravies and soups. In Eastern Europe and Scandinavia, crushed potatoes are heated to convert their starch to fermentable sugars 
that are used in the distillation of alcoholic beverages such as vodka. Second, non-food uses. First of all, as a glue. Potato starch is widely used by the pharmaceutical, textile, wood and paper industries as an adhesive, binder, texture agent and filler. Potato starch is a 100% biodegradable substitute for polystyrene and other plastics. It's used in disposable plates, dishes and knives. In the production of fuel grade ethanol, potato peel and other zero value wastes from potato processing are rich in starch that can be liquefied and fermented to produce fuel grade ethanol as a nutrient medium. Potato is a good substrate for the growth of microorganisms. The liquor from boiled potatoes called potato broth has long been used as a nutrient medium in experimental microbiological work. Lastly, medicinal uses. Potato is reported to be bactericide, calmative, diuretic, emetic, lactagorge. Potato is a folk remedy for burns, corns, cough, cystitis, fistula, prostatus, scurvy, spasms, tumors, and warts. The mealy flora of baked potato is oiled and applied to frostbite. The tea made from the peels of the tuber is said to be a folk remedy for tumors. The boiled tuber is said to elevate corns. The powdered tuber with the copper sulfate is said to help callicid fistulas. So students, with this we came to the end of today's lecture. I hope you might have understood it. See you next time.